The history of tea spreads across multiple cultures over the span of thousands of years. Tea plant has native to East Asia and probably originated in the borderlands of southwestern China and northern Myanmar. One of the earliest accounts of tea drinking is dated back to China's Shang Dynasty, in which tea was consumed as a medicinal drink. It first became known to the Western world through Portuguese priests and merchants in China during the early 16th century. Dur uh, drinking tea became popular in Britain during the 17th century. The British introduced commercial tea production to British India in order to compete with the Chinese monopoly on tea in the 1820s, when the British East India Company began large-scale production of tea in the Assam region. Tea reached Britain via the Dutch East India Company sometime around 1650. The popularity of this new beverage was such that limited quantities available were sold at prices of £10 per pound weight. In fact, in those days, tea was so valuable that anyone fortunate enough to afford some would keep it under lock and key. In September 1658, the first ever advertisement for tea appeared in an early London news sheet called the Mercurius Politicus. In around 1700, grocers began to sell tea. A common practice was to mix dried leaves with it to bring the price down, to raise the profit. However, the government of the time soon put a stop to that. By 1785, there were 30,000 wholesalers and retailers in Britain who were registered as tea merchants. The tea bush is a member of the camellia family and is an evergreen tropical plant. In its natural state, it grows wild among the undergrowth in tropical rainforests. It's an adaptable plant and has a life of 50 to 100 years. Varieties have been raised that will grow in cold weather or sweltering summers, up in the mountains or in lowland plantations. Bushes grown in different areas vary to a certain extent. Indian plants, for example, usually have large leaves with a single stem, whereas in China, the plants have smaller leaves. New bushes are grown mainly from cuttings. These are taken from selected mother plants and planted out in orderly rows in tea gardens and plantations. The plants are close enough together to intertwine as they grow and thus form a low leafy bush, just at the right height for pluckers to remove shoots or tips. It takes from three to five years, depending on the altitude of the plantation, for the young plant to grow into a bush ready for tea production. Pluckers normally pick two leaves and a bud as this is the part from which the tea is manufactured. On average, the plants are plucked once a week. These young leaves must be handled very carefully in order to avoid bruising and breaking. A skilled plucker will gather as many as 40,000 tips, weighing 100 pounds, that's 45 kilograms, in a day. And it takes about four pounds of green tea to make one pound of black tea found in a packet. Consumption of tea is so high that a total of 9,000 million bushes are needed to keep up with demand. After the green tea has been picked, it goes through a withering process, which usually lasts 12 hours. Sometimes it can take up to 16 hours if the leaf is wet. The crisp leaves are put in troughs through which fresh air is blown to remove moisture. During withering, the leaf changes both in appearance and in chemical composition. When the leaves have become limp, they are rolled between two metal surfaces, or altern alternatively, they go through a crush, tear, or cut process to rupture the cells and release the natural juices and enzymes, which give tea its color, thickness, and flavor. From here, the tea goes into a fermenting house. Here, the leaves are put into containers through, um, through which air is passed. Humidity and temperature are controlled while oxidization takes place and the tea gains its optimum color and quality. However, this process must be stopped before the tea becomes stewed. This is done by firing where the tea is passed through a large chamber into which heated dry air is forced. At the end of this process, the tea has become dry and black. Finally, the black tea is graded by a series of vibrating um, sieves into various sizes with names such as orange peekery, broken orange peekery, fannings and dust, 
which indicates the size of the leaf. Once the tea has been manufactured, it is ready to be sold, usually by auction. The tea is packed into lined paper sacks or plywood chests lined with aluminium foil to keep it fresh. On arrival in the UK, the tea is stored in warehouses. Samples are taken from the chests and sacks from small holes from the suppliers to taste. Sainsbury's suppliers have very specific blend and weight requirements. They will buy the necessary um, different teas and blend them. Popular brands of tea sold at Sainsbury's can be a blend of as many as 30 different teas. Skilled blenders mix together the various teas that they have available to produce the same blend all year round. In this way, favourite brands always taste the same, even though the teas in it will, be, will change depending on the time of year and availability. Each blend includes tea to give it strength, flavour and colour. It is the blender's responsibility to retain the flavour and quality of a blend, even though the original teas change with the season. When the recipe for a blend is reached, the details are passed on to the factory, who then combine the correct proportions in a large blending drum. This revolves and thoroughly mixes all the different teas. The blend is now ready for packing into packets or tea bags. For packets, the tea is put into a hopper from where it is carefully measured. A machine fills and seals each packet and checks the weight. Tea bag tea is fed into specifically designed machines which fill thousands of bags each minute, then packs them into cartons. At the turn of the 20th century, Sainsbury's was a provision merchant specialising in dairy and fresh provisions, whereas tea was the domain of the retail grocer who prepared dry, often important, imported goods for sale, blending teas and spices and roasting and grinding coffees, often to closely guarded recipes. By the late 19th century, the exclusive image of the high class grocer had begun to change. The abolition of imported duties had made many grocers, particularly tea at uh, many groceries, particularly tea and sugar, affordable to many people. Thomas Lipton's introduction of cheap, ready packed tea into his shops in 1889 had helped to break down the historic boundaries between the provision merchant's trade and that of the grocer. In 1903, John James Sainsbury acquired a number of shops from another chain retailer, Thomas Decock who had left the food trade to help run Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. One of these, at 12's Kingsland High Street, sold teas, sugar, coffee, cocoa, canned fish and fruit. And John James decided to add all of these grocery products to Sainsbury's growing product range. Recognising the expertise required for the selection and blending of tea, John James approached George Payne and Company, tea merchants of Tower Bridge. John, George Payne was a great friend of the founder and together John James and George selected different blends identified by the coloured seals on the packets. Red label, blue label and green label were launched at the opening of the Ealing branch in March 1903. The new product line proved popular and by the end of July sales were well over £900 weight per week. For this achievement the Ealing branch won a prize of £20 for the highest sales of tea at any Sainsbury shop. Oh, sorry, the highest sales of anything at a Sainsbury shop. In fact, tea was so important to the company that John James sent his fifth son, Alfred, for training in the art of tasting and blending teas. Alfred was admitted to his father's firm as a grocery buyer in 1906 with the responsibility of purchasing tea. Different blends were available at different prices, identified by the coloured seals on the packets. Red label was the most expensive at one shilling sixpence per pound, followed by green label at one shilling four pence per pound and blue label at one shilling two pence. A year later in 1904, two further blends were introduced in order to meet competition from home and colonial stores. Yellow label at one shilling and brown label at one shilling eight pence per pound Red Label Tea is the oldest surviving own brand product and it's still on sale today. Red Label is a blend of up to 25 different teas with a good proportion of quality Kenyan teas 
giving it a distinctive red, reddish liquor. It is still supplied by the same company, which is now known as Finley's, and was licensed to carry the fair trade mark in October 2007. Tea was not rationed in the First World War since the government felt it was a luxury item. Supplies were controlled, however, and some hoarding took place. JS customers were urged to register with the firm to ensure that supplies were shared out fairly according to availability and family needs. During the 1920s, blue caddy tea was introduced as a delicious blend for particular people. At two shillings, eight pence per pound, this was one of the most expensive teas sold at Sainsbury's and was not stocked in all the branches. It had a distinctive blue packet carrying an illustration of a Chinese star caddy. This was reproduced as a Christmas gift tin containing one pound of the tea. During the 1930s, the advertising campaign for premium blend blue caddy tea featured the pilot Amy Johnson, who had made a number of historic long distant flights. Sainsbury took some credit for her skill and endurance, as it was obviously the powers of blue caddy tea that had helped her to soar to the dizzying heights. A picture of Amy daintily sipping, daintily sipping blue caddy featured on Sainsbury's posters and price lists for several years following her expedition, and she was the first public figure used by Sainsbury's in an advertising campaign. Between 1905 and 1910, Sainsbury's gave away beautifully illustrated cards depicting various well-known fairy tales, free with purchases of tea. Customers could collect them to form complete sets and fill a companion album. The idea was that customers would buy tea regularly in order to collect all the cards. The success of this strategy is clear from the memories of an early customer's daughter, and she said, each Friday afternoon, my mother would meet me from school, from where we went to the Red Hill branch of Sainsbury's to buy the weekly groceries. For me, the most important item was the packet of tea containing an instalment of a fairy story. I would wait in an agony of suspense until we opened the packet on leaving the shop. The back of each card was meant to be just as entertaining as the front. Each fairy tale is vividly narrated and most sets feature an early form of product placement with reference J. Sainsbury's pure tea woven into the story. We find out that a cup of Sainsbury's pure tea revived Jack, who was very faint after his tumble from the beanstalk. On his way to see Sleeping Beauty, the prince had helped himself to a cup of J. Sainsbury's pure tea. And Cinderella fled, but on the stairs she lost one of her glass slippers and she missed her cup of J. Sainsbury's pure tea too, poor thing. Sainsbury's advertising didn't tend to be as elaborate as other companies such as Lipton's. They used every possible advertising medium from hot air balloons that dropped advertising telegrams to monster cheeses which arrived at branches pulled by elephants. However, on one occasion, John James Sainsbury was goaded into making a direct response to this extravagant publicity. When Thomas Lipton was awarded a royal warrant, he erected signs over his shops proclaiming, we serve the king. Where Sainsbury's had um, branches directly opposite Lipton's, banners were erected, which read, God save the queen. Sainsbury's teas were first packaged into cartons designed by Leonard Bowman in 1961. The JS Journal boasted that the new packets were virtually sh uh, shake-proof, that they didn't away with leakage, and that they made handling packs. Um, they made handier packs for the housewife. Packets of tea have undergone many design changes at Sainsbury's, um, as they introduced their in-house design team in the 1960s. Tea bags were first introduced by Tetley's in 1953, and JS own label tea bags were available from 1968. In 1979, Sainsbury's introduced what would be considered speciality teas into their range and started selling teas such as Earl Grey, Darjeeling and Lapsang Souchong. I just wanted to show you a couple of videos to finish up. The first is a whistle-stop tour of the packaging changes to Sainsbury's teas over the last century. I think one of the really interesting things is that um, loose leaf tea and brown packets must have been in place for nearly 60 years. 
And then you can really see how packaging and variety changed quite rapidly from 1961. And the final video is a snippet of a 40 minute long film um, from the press team at Sainsbury's produced in 1984. This film features Dame, uh, Jane Babbage, who was Sainsbury's home uh, economist, giving a talk to a women's group in Bath. This particular section is about how Sainsbury's makes its red label tea. You might like to have a cup of tea. Uh, the red label tea is probably our most popular one. And obviously we sell it in different sizes as well as in tea bags. I always prefer the taste of loose tea myself, and I think it's better value for money anyway. And it's surprising the number of groups that I go to and find that when they're making the tea at the end of the talk, it's nearly always red label stains with tea. And whether or not it's specially for me, I don't know, but uh, it's always very nice indeed. All our teas are still blended in the traditional way, a process that hasn't changed at all over the years. Recently, I was lucky enough to go and see John Sturgeon, who does all our blending, to try and pick up some of his secrets. Right, risk, good colour. Forty chest of cat and ball. Right, full of strength, good colour. John, tell me what you're doing. At the moment, we're accepting these teas, which were bought in auction. The red label tea bag and then we'll, we'll go through afterwards and make the quantities we require for the blend. Which just of the same? What colour? How many teas go into red label blend? Approximately 27 different teas. The teas vary from country to country and from garden to garden and even from week by week and we have to discard those and this is why we taste these teas. The actual blend should stay the same year in and year out. Um, Pick out 100 chests. Three chests. Bombay, 20 chests. We'll leave that for the moment. Have a half and half. St. Daniel, 120 chests. Two chests of that one. Ceceba, 20 chests. One chest of that. That's what it's over. Single 20 chest, now we we'll leave that one for a moment. Got in gold, of course. 